Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to know how the Air Force flew planes overhead of an NFL game at the last note of the national anthem. And you know, the best part about this job is that I get to be a nine-year-old kid again. I'm almost 50. I've been on aircraft carriers. I've done air assaults, the 101st Airborne. I did the, the military police pistol qualification. But you know, one thing I haven't done at 50, I've never watched that TV show, The Office. So before I start the video, give me 60 seconds to pay the bills here. I want to talk about private internet access and how I finally watched The Office. So click the link in the description below or go to PIAVPN.com slash Macbeth to get 83% off. PIA is an app that changes your IP address, making it look like you're physically located in another part of the world that you choose. It's also a VPN. Now, a VPN or virtual private network creates a secure tunnel between you and the public internet that hackers and rogue government agents can't penetrate. And private internet access is actually open source. You can download their code from GitHub. I made a YouTube now, but I was a software engineer and I do have a degree in computer science. This actually impressed me because it shows that private internet access really has nothing to hide. The client's available on desktop for Mac, PC, and Linux, as well as iOS and Android. And private internet access doesn't limit the amount of devices you connect. So you can be on your laptop, your iPad, your phone all at the same time. But, but let's get back to the office. So I put private internet access into a UK streaming optimized mode, which is a little bit faster than the standard VPN. And as you can see, I'm on uh, the first episode of season two right now, and I have access to all the shows in the UK that I can't get in the US. So click the link in the description below and go to PAAVPN.com slash Macbeth to get 83% off. Don't ruin anything in the office for me in the comments. Now let's talk about flyovers. How does the military execute a perfect flyover of a football game at the last note of the national anthem? I was pretty curious about this myself, so I called around and the 175th wing of the Maryland Air National Guard invited me to embed with them and learn how it's done. And what I saw impressed the heck out of me. There's far more to it than just hopping in your jet and taking it for a spin. These flyovers are coordinated months in advance and involve hundreds of man hours and planning and coordination with the Secretary of the Air Force, the wing, and the organization that requested the flyover. It all starts with the wing. After all, no wing, no planes, no flyover. Now, quick note, you know how the Army has brigades and regiments, battalions, companies, and platoons? Well, the Air Force has wings, groups, squadrons, and flights. The wing is kind of like a brigade. It will contain multiple groups, which sort of act like an Army or Marine Corps battalion. Each group does one specific thing, and there are multiple groups inside the wing. Think of the group as kind of like a battalion, and the squadron as kind of like a company, and a flight as kind of like a platoon. For example, the 175th wing contains a headquarters, the operations group, a maintenance group, a cyberspace ops group, a medical group, a mission support group, and some specialized units. These groups are further broken down into squadrons. And the squadron that we're interested in is the 104th Fighter Squadron, which is part of the operations group. They fly the jets that perform the flyovers. And this particular squadron has 21 A-10C Thunderbolt II attack aircraft. Nationwide, there are 25 fighter squadrons in the Air National Guard, and they all play a critical role in domestic missions and federal tasking. Many of these airmen serve part-time. The National Guard is a part-time reserve force, after all. In real life, these airmen may be anything from blue-collar workers to students to airline pilots, but one weekend a month, and oftentimes more, they pull on a uniform and help protect America. I was embedded with the 175th Wing, and specifically the 104th Fighter Squadron, which flies the famous A-10C Thunderbolt II close air support aircraft. This unit is actually 100 years old. It started in 1921 when it was formed by reserve officers and World War I veterans, many of whom were also members of the Baltimore Flying Club, which helped advocate for the creation of such a unit. In recent years, the unit deployed eight times, most recently to Iraq, which provided close air support in the fight against the Islamic State. So, during this video, if I blot out the faces of some of the pilots or only use their call signs, that's why. Some of these pilots will likely deploy to combat zones again. 
You know, when I, um, when I first mentioned on social media that I was doing this video about how the military does flyovers, a few people told me that flyovers were a waste of money. But I discovered the real answer couldn't be further from the truth. If there's one thing a pilot has to do, it's be in the right place at the right time under restricted conditions to put ordnance on target. Let's take a look at Baltimore, Maryland, specifically M&T Bank Stadium, where the Baltimore Ravens American football team plays. The pilots have to fly down a hot target line that runs over the Francis Scott Key Bridge, over Fort McHenry, and then over the stadium. To the right, there's tall buildings. To the left, there's Baltimore Washington International Airport. This requires a close working relationship with the professionals at the FAA's Potomac Terminal Radar Approach Control, or TRACCON. The 104th Fighter Squadron sends Potomac TRACCON the plan for their hold, the ingress or flight in, the egress or flight out, and timing weeks prior to the flyover so they're prepared to deconflict civilian traffic to maintain a safe and efficient movement of air traffic. Clearing air traffic so that four A-10s can blitz across your radar at five miles a minute at low altitude is no easy feat. But Potomac Tracon is good at their job and they make it look easy. Now, you know how I said five miles a minute? You might think that the corridor between downtown Baltimore and BWI is pretty big. And when you're traveling at 300 knots or 345 miles an hour, you can go one mile in about 10 seconds. So there's not a lot of room for error. And by approaching from a specific direction, you are simulating the kind of constraints you're gonna face on the battlefield. They call this deconfliction, and it's pretty hard to do. Heck, one of the reasons that Russia failed to establish air superiority at the start of their war with Ukraine was that Russia had so many problems with deconfliction that they were shooting down their own aircraft. The A-10 is a tough plane, but it's going to lose in a battle with an artillery shell that's flying overhead on the way to its ground target. So certain areas of the map might be made off limits for fire support coordination measures to reduce or mitigate the effects of friendly fire. So the flyover simulates flying with constraints under combat conditions. But don't take my word for it. Take Iron Mike's. He's an A-10 pilot for the 104th Squadron, and he said, There are a lot of similarities between what we do on a typical uh, tactical mission versus what you might do or see on a flyover for any particular event. Really, it's an exercise of uh, being on time, on target, over bad guy land in order to accomplish the mission. And it just so happens today that our target in bad guy land is M&T Bank Stadium in Baltimore. So. Uh, most people think that it may not be the most pertinent training for a fighter squadron. However, I, I think that that couldn't be further from the truth. You know, these hours have been allocated to the fighter squadron. The money is there uh, and we would be flying regardless. So I think it's actually very beneficial to our pilots and uh, to the mission. Now, you know how Iron Mike said the hours have been allocated? American pilots get between 15 and 20 hours of flying a month. And yes, the National Guard has to maintain the same standards as the active duty Air Force. So that means pilots will actually take off of work and come in during the week to fly. And the Air National Guard maintains a small part-time force at their airfields in order to generate these sorties. Now, most of the pilots I spoke with are airline pilots in civilian life. They work for Southwest and Delta and American. Heck, half the unit works at United. And one of the questions I asked was whether they ever put their hands in the wrong place during an emergency procedure because they are in the wrong jet. I mean, I drive a Tesla. When I get into a rental car, I automatically reach for a drive stock that isn't there. So do pilots ever forget they're in an A-10 instead of a 737? No. And I initially found this hard to believe, but these guys are, are different. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that fighter pilots are different human beings than the rest of us, but they're highly trained and exceptionally skilled. They are able to manage complex tasks and maintain spatial awareness while subjecting their body to some pretty extensive gravitational forces. And even though they have this ability and a little bit of swagger, when I asked what makes a good fighter pilot, the one answer that kept popping up was humble, approachable, incredible. Humility is essential because it fosters a continuous learning mindset, allowing them to acknowledge their limitations and seek improvement. 
Approachability ensures effective communication and teamwork among fellow pilots, ground crew, and superiors, all of whom play a critical role in mission success. And credibility is vital, not only in gaining trust from their peers, but also in earning the respect and confidence of those who rely on them in life or death situations. These qualities not only enhance a fighter pilot's performance, but also contribute to a cohesive and reliable team that is essential for success in the challenging world of aerial combat. Now, this whole flyover starts with a form, specifically DD Form 2535, which has to be filled out and sent to the U.S. Air Force on their website. The Secretary of the Air Force Public Affairs Team will then review the request, and you can even specify the unit that you would like to perform the flyover. The Secretary of the Air Force Public Affairs Team verifies that the request meets two criteria. Does the request coincide and support training? Does the request have a value for recruiting? Once the flyover is deemed eligible, a squadron can volunteer to support. Then the volunteering unit blocks out that time on their training calendar and they allocate the resources they need to fill that mission. Additionally, current operations and training will schedule airspace and training objectives for the formation to accomplish in their sortie before the actual flyover. So they're getting training done before they fly overhead. Now, in this case, they went to a local restricted area and worked out a limited close air support mission and low altitude navigation scenario prior to entering the hold on the eastern shore to get ready for their flyover. The unit also coordinates with their host. In this case, it's Baltimore Ravens Senior Director of Entertainment, Ilsa Martin. She's responsible for generating the run of show. This is a document that lists the times of every single event down to the second. I'm our Senior Director of Entertainment and Events, so as far as game day goes, I produce our game from the field, so essentially anything that's not football related or not video board content, I have a hand in overseeing that, but specifically scheduling our anthem performers, flyovers, pre-game festivities and our halftime entertainment. For us, we want every game to be different and to be the best experience possible for our fans. And so working with these guys from the A-10s and providing a flyover for our fans is something that our fans always look forward to and helps just really kick off the game and have everyone in high energy to cheer on the team. Now working with the director of entertainment is the Groundhog. In this case, call sign Otter. Note that Groundhog is just a term that's used by this particular unit since the A-10 is often called the Warthog or just the Hog. Otter is really functioning as a JTAC, or Joint Terminal Attack Controller. This is a special kind of airman who knows how to direct aircraft at targets, but since the 175th Wing doesn't have a JTAC, they use another A-10 pilot, since that pilot knows how to relay information back to the flight. Otter uses a PRC-152 radio to remain in contact with the airbase and planes that once they're in the air. He has his own copy of the run of show, and later on, he'll be in constant communications with the A-10s during their mission. Now back at the base, in this case, Martin State Airport, north of Baltimore, the pilots are in the operations room getting their weather, times, and any tanker information. They get their briefing from the SOF, or Supervisor of Flying. He's a pilot who manages a day-to-day -day aviation operations focused on the operational efficiency and compliance with regulations, procedures, and standards. The SOF has the final word on who gets to fly. If you're supposed to do a mission and your training isn't up to date, the SOF is the last line of defense in preventing an unsafe flight. Today's flyover will be crewed by Queen in the first position, Van Gogh in the second, Iron Mike in the third, and Hash in the fourth. Now, you know how I just mentioned tankers? The A-10, along with most modern fighter aircraft, are able to refuel in midair using a tanker. This gives them the ability to perform long-range missions or even cross oceans. Now, once finished in ops, the pilots go to the vault, which I can't show you or talk about, but suffice to say they're given another briefing there which might be needed for any classified parts of the mission. While this is going on, maintainers are hard at work at getting the jets ready to fly. They go through every aircraft logbook and compare its forms with the IMDS, or Integrated Maintenance Data System, to make sure there are no last-minute deficiencies. And while this is going on, the ground crews are fueling the aircraft. Note that they do not perform the flyovers armed. No weapons are on the aircraft when a flyover is performed, and they even put a pin in the gun to prevent it from firing as a double safety measure. Then the pilots leave the vault and go to the AFE, or Aircrew Flight Equipment Room. They suit up in their life vest and their G-suit. 
Surprisingly, they don't actually wear a survival vest or carry a pistol like in the movies. They do carry a small survival kit, but the full aircrew survival gear is really more for combat than stateside training. Once they finish dressing, the crew goes back to the operations room to get one final briefing. And once the paperwork checks out, the soft will say, Tell you that. Cleared to Cool, thank you. Yeah. And the pilots step out onto the tarmac and head to their jets. There they meet the crew chief. The crew chief is a maintainer who performs pre-flight and post-flight inspections, troubleshoots any on-the-spot issues, and performs any necessary repairs. They also launch and recover the aircraft. The crew chiefs inspect the A-10s and take them through their startup sequence. And the A-10s take to the sky. It's game day in Baltimore. The Baltimore Ravens are 7-2, and, and today they're playing the Seattle Seahawks. The fans file into the stadium. The A-10s loiter over Chesapeake Bay. I climb all the way up to Section 514 and set up my gear. The national anthem starts, and Otter guides the aircraft in. I can't provide you with the audio conversation, but Otter is basically letting the aircraft know what line the singer is at in the national anthem. It takes one minute and 42 seconds to sing the national anthem in the run of show, and the pilots take that into account as they start their approach. And now, performing our national anthem, written here in Baltimore, please welcome J.D. Sapp. Just another day at the office. There are quite a few people I'd like to thank. To start, Colonel Rich Hunt, commander of the 175th Wing. Without your support, this video would have just been a dream of mine. Next, Otter, Queen, Snarf, Van Gogh, Iron Mike, and Hash, as well as a number of other pilots who spoke to me, but asked that their names and call signs not be used for security concerns. Major Michael Ashbrook, the head of maintainers, nobody flies without your airmen turning wrenches. Public Affairs Officer Major Ben Hughes, Staff Sergeant Kemper, and Senior Airman Hutner for escorting me around as I asked loads and loads of questions. And thank you to maintainers Senior Airman Phillips, Senior Airman Kosobinski, and Senior Airman Dominguez Reyes who taught me how the Guard launches and recovers and maintains aircraft. Finally, Thank you to Lilsa Martin of the Baltimore Ravens for letting me follow you around and pepper you with all sorts of questions about your job. Hey, 
If you want to support the channel, you can get my a very NORAD Christmas sweater from Bunker Branding. It all goes to making awesome content like this and features an American F-15, Santa's reindeer, and a Canadian CF-18 guarding Santa on his flight through the night. You can also join my Substack for five bucks where you can get analysis that I can't post on YouTube. And thank you guys so much for watching. In a world where fashion meets firepower, where style becomes strategy, it's time to gear up for the ultimate mission with Bunker Branding. Introducing the Rock Out With Your Chalk Out t-shirt, a tribute to the fearless air cavalry. Feel the adrenaline rush as you don the pride of the skies. For those of you who dare from the air, precision and power unite when you think outside the bomb. And don't miss our Live Laugh Launch t-shirts for Patriot and Highmars, because sometimes defending freedom means bringing the thunder. Finally, for the true defender of the seas, we present Department of the Boat People. Say of honor and show your allegiance to the world's mightiest maritime force. With these shirts, hoodies, and stickers, along with the tow missile, landmines, and drone warfare. These aren't just shirts, they're statements. They're your way of saying I stand for strength, unity, and style. Get yours at Bunker Branding today.